Anyway, I'd like to thank you all for coming on. I can't really see who's on here. I might have an idea uh, from the list I have here. First, I would like to um, welcome you all to this roundtable with the boards of realtors in the Monadnock and Kentucket Valley uh, of Southwestern New Hampshire. Um, we do this every so often with Congresswoman Custer bringing um, advocacy agenda forward with what concerns realtors and our, our buyers and sellers out there that uh, is so critical. Um, so I do have a couple of other uh, welcomes. First though, thank you Annie for coming from um, taking time out of your day and we'll hopefully get through this hour without any more glitches and it's always good to, uh, I can't see you now, but I'll just say it's always good to see you. I know uh, we'll see each other soon. Um, we, I might have some people on here. I can't tell. Uh, we might have our current uh, new, uh, board president over here in the Mananoc region, Kim Mastriani, if he's on and he can wave. That Kim is great. on. Yep. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if our past president, Robin Sanctuary, he may or may not be on. Robin is on. Um, oh, great. Um, then I think Bill Taylor over in Peterborough is the past president of Peterborough uh, Kentucky Valley Board. Bill and is on. If you recall, Paul Annie back in 2019, we were at So Clean and Bill was running for select board over there. And I'm happy to report to you he's made it. He's been working hard for Peterborough over there. So nice job, um, Bill. Got got elected and uh and several others. I think Adam Godette might be on our state president. Yeah, Adam's on. Wave. Okay. Oh, this is going better than I had planned. <laughs> yeah, you have a good All right. group. Um, Good, we got some good folks out there. We're bringing them from all corners of the Southwest region from Walpole to Peterborough to Keene and everywhere. So um, we're gonna um, bring up some, uh, some topics of interest. There were some questions that I know that we as realtors and I think um, everybody might need a little more uh, research on and maybe su uh, submitting some personal stories of how those uh, issues are affecting us, and I'll get to those in a moment, but to send off some topics, Annie, to go over entirely, uh, oh, not entirely, but of the 20 items or plus that we have in front of us, uh, supporting um, housing in New Hampshire that spurs growth is a, a top uh, topic that's top on our list throughout the state, and I know throughout the country. Uh, also, uh, some of them, and these aren't in any order, student debt and prohibiting students from uh, graduating, staying in New Hampshire for one thing, and also uh, the uh, barrier that's there as far as getting um, housing, I mean, buying a home. And then strengthening the Fair Housing Act. There's a lot of issues coming up there where we're in, in the forefront for over 50 years on fair housing, and that uh, takes some revisiting from time to time. And also, I think under the spurring New Hampshire housing might be something as incentives for developers and builders as well. So that's quite a broad range to start with. And I'll let you take it from there and, and get them one by one or however you'd like to move forward before we go out for questions and take your time. And I'm here sure. to listen. And we're Great, all here. David, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to the whole group for being with us. Um, I'm going to start with some general comments, and then I'm happy to go through a few more specifics on the questions that you raise. But essentially, start with number one, housing is one of the very top issues in the state and a priority for my team uh, here in the second congressional district and in Congress. And so I keep coming back to examples of when um, we have put our shoulder to the wheel to make sure that we're moving forward with affordable housing. Uh, and let me just take you all back a bit, if I could, Two years ago, literally today, I mean, yesterday was the 13th and all day long, I remembered that Friday, the 13th of March um, in 2020, when the world just closed down, Congress was faced with what could have been a total economic collapse during the shutdown in the face of a highly contagious global pandemic. And instead, we find ourselves in a pretty extraordinary place. And I really want to give credit to the staff that we work with in Congress and the bipartisan effort um, to come together through the American Rescue Plan, through the Paycheck Protection Plan Program, um, through support to small business. Um, it, the list was long. The acronyms were many. 
Um, but the bottom line is the federal government stepped up to infuse cash into our communities so that we didn't have a total economic collapse. And what's extraordinary in New Hampshire, we started out very, very low unemployment, 2.6%. At the height of the shutdown, we went up to 16% unemployment, almost uh, one in five families having lost at least one job, if not two. Um, that was a very precarious position to be in. And then now we're all the way back down to 2.6% unemployment again. And what I see when I go out to businesses now in this post-COVID era is actually a very hot economy. Things are going very, very well for many, many businesses. Some small businesses, restaurants in particular, still struggling um, as people get their courage up and get out to uh, you know, socialize in a public way. But companies like Fidelity, 900 new job openings, BAE, 900 new job openings. The, what I'm more likely to hear from employers about is what a tight labor market it is and how hard it is to find uh, people in this labor market. So housing is a lifeline, and particularly in rural communities across the southern and western and northern part of the my district, housing is a lifeline. You're not going to fill those jobs if people can't afford housing in the region. And we also need to care for our most vulnerable citizens. And, and with that, I mean um, young families, families on lower income because they're just getting into the workplace, their wages are lower, as well as seniors who are living on fixed income. Housing is very difficult under those circumstances. So unfortunately, in my point of view, affordable housing has for way too long been underfunded. And our nation's affordable housing stock is often outdated and in need of serious repairs. And you can see that in New Hampshire. I love our beautiful wood construction and our beautiful wood homes. But as you drive around, uh, people who cannot afford the upkeep, and it's expensive. If you go to paint a house these days, 10,000, 15,000, 20,000. Uh, my husband and I just got a new roof and we had to go out and get an equity line to pay for it. So it's tough keeping a house in good repair, particularly if your income is limited or you may have lost a job at some point during COVID. Um, so my main um, thrust here is that I'm committed to working in Congress to ensure that communities across my district, including, including small rural communities, have access to affordable housing. I do a lot of this work through the US Department of Agriculture programming. Um, and that's one of the reasons that I continue to sit on the House Agriculture Committee so that we'll have good access to that funding. I talked a little bit about the American Rescue Plan. I'm proud of the work there and proud of the votes. And um, we are focused on housing, nutritional assistance, supportive service, and obviously bolstering the nationwide uh, vaccine rollout so that we can get to the post-COVID era. Um, so communities across the state have been able to dedicate resources to critical infrastructure, housing, water, sewer, and of course, broadband. I also back the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. That's what we call the, uh, the, the BIF, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Bill. This is going to bring much needed funding to New Hampshire. And you saw President Joe Biden have his very first infrastructure visit with us on the bridge up in uh, North Woodstock, New Hampshire. Then you saw Secretary Pete Buttigieg, who's close to many of us in New Hampshire, now Secretary of Department of Transportation, standing on a bridge with us in Manchester. We are going to get maximum funding to repair roads and bridges, expand commuter rail, uh, further deliver on this broadband expansion promise, and lower energy costs. Energy costs are one of the reasons that housing is expensive in New Hampshire. Um, so these have been unique challenges during COVID, 
But the silver lining, I would say, is that we've gotten some significant funding out of these programs for housing and that, um, uh, that dream of home ownership that we all believe in, um, in attaining affordable mortgages and making sure we have um, good housing stock. Um, I talked about broadband. I think you know I'm on the House Energy and Commerce Committee, and I'm also a member of the House Rural Broadband Task Force. So I have been on the front lines of ensuring that rural communities are not left behind. And last but certainly not least in this section, I want to remind everyone that part of our COVID response was critical assistance for both renters and landlords and homeowners. Um, since it was launched, the New Hampshire Emergency Rental Assistance Program has spent $66 million to help more than 9,000 households. And that was a really significant goal of ours. In addition to keeping paychecks flowing, even during the shutdown, we wanted to make sure that families did not lose the roof over their head. And I wanna say, I think we've done an, an admirable job at that. Um, just as a shout out here, if you or someone you know is struggling to pay past or current rent or utilities, please visit capnh.org, C-A-P-N-H.org to apply for assistance. Those funds are still flowing. Additionally, homeowners in need of assistance with mortgage payments, property charges, or utility payments who have experienced a COVID-related reduction of income or an increase in household expenses can visit the New Hampshire Financing Authority online. And that was another really big program, not just tenants renting, but homeowners not lose their, um, their house or be foreclosed. So I'm, I'm very excited to join in this discussion. And um, let me just turn to, a few of your specific questions, and, um, and then we can open it up if, if people have more. Um, one of the things that we have been focused on is affordable housing. And um, just as I, in the last couple of months, have started to get out and about at more public events uh, at, toward the end of COVID, um, we're making some really significant mm -hmm. gains in public housing. Um, and in the low income housing tax credit, so subsidies for the acquisition, construction, and rehabilitation of affordable rental housing for low and moderate income tenants. And, you know, when I go to the, the groundbreaking or the ribbon cutting, there's always a tremendous sign with about 30 different uh, logos on it of what it takes to put these projects together, um, working with the community housing authorities, working with our construction companies around the state that are so good at, at these projects, working with the banks, working with the finance, um, but just recently, for example, I visited in uh, Bethlehem, New Hampshire. If you ever happen to make it up there, um, you can't see it from the road. So you have to turn off, uh, but drive up that long driveway. These are beautiful. I, I am so impressed at the quality of this project. Um, at beautiful homes, uh, single bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom for big families, for working class people. Um, uh, affordable housing in the North Country, particularly in these recreation towns, these ski towns, very, very difficult to come by. Um, I also just last week visited uh, a project over in Claremont that you may be familiar with. There's a big project that we did a, a groundbreaking before COVID, and that's made tremendous progress. And then an interesting program in Cl Claremont that's not low-income housing, but it's a, it, it, it is going to be market rate housing. But you know those mill buildings? It's right behind the Common Man restaurant and the hotel. Um, spectacular renovation of one of those mill buildings. I was ready to buy a, an apartment while I was there. <laughs> it was so beautiful. These huge windows and looking out on Mount Escutney and looking out at the river. But they it's sort of mixed because they have um, 
some of the apartments were studios and, and they're small, but that's the way we live when I'm in Washington, DC. We all live that way down there. You, you don't have a big Victorian with extra rooms. You can live in you know, 600 square feet, 700, 800. Um, and so that building was a really interesting one talking to that developer. Um, David, you might know him from over in, um, in Peterborough. Um, but just the mix of the high end, you know, big apartments up on the top floor with spectacular views and then down on the first floor, these uh, sort of affordable, more affordable working style housing. I don't um, know what you mean. Pardon? Yes, I do recall. Thank you. Yeah. And then, um, and then we've also seen new housing in Franklin. Uh, Catch the the affordable housing group out of Concord did a spectacular renovation of a mill building up there. And then um, right here in Concord, um, the brand new uh, Rosemary um, Rosemary's Way, which was that um, Catch honoring their former uh, executive director. And that one, again, just beautiful. I was there right before the families were going to move in. And, you know, one bedroom, two bedroom, a little bit of yard for the kids in the back. And just very pleasant, very nicely done. Um, and, and it makes a big difference. We haven't had that level of new housing here in New Hampshire, um, and it's certainly in the Concord area. Um, so I'm going to continue to support this low income housing tax credit program, as well as I mentioned the US Department of Agriculture gets involved in rural um, housing, affordable housing, and I'd love to visit any projects that it's one of my favorite things. It's just so hopeful to go see these. Um, uh, briefly, I talked about the supporting solutions that spur New Hampshire housing supply. So we talked about the American Rescue Plan. Um, just for you to understand this, this ARPA funding, $1.4 billion for state, local, and county governments in New Hampshire. So as I like to say in DC, this is real money where I come from. We, we pump some serious money into the uh, local governments and, and into the economy. Um, through the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery fund, uh, New Hampshire received almost a billion dollars, $995 million. And, um, and then just last week, we, had, uh, we passed our omnibus funding bill and uh, my office secured 10 community projects um, all around the district, um, Keene, I think Peterborough, um, Lebanon. I was making phone calls all over Nashua, uh, Berlin. And those are um, community projects. This is the first time in the 10 years that I've been around where we've had that funding, but they will be helpful quality of life um, and then at one a slightly off topic thing, but something that is important in your world, I had sponsored a bill for years about the installation of carbon monoxide alarms, um, and that passed as part of that omnibus bill uh, last week. Okay, what else were you asking about? Student debt, I think that's a really important question, actually, as it relates to home ownership. I certainly look at my own uh, two sons, 30 and 33. By that point, my husband and I, uh, you know, were getting married, buying our home, getting into a mortgage. In fact, I think we each had a home and a mortgage before we even got married, but that's not the case nowadays. These kids have got serious student loans. And, um, and we've got to deal with that to make sure that they'll be able to get into home ownership. So um, again, a top priority for me, uh, proud to say this omnibus bill that passed last week, 24 billion for federal state student um, loan programs, which is a significant increase, $35 million increase um, above the previous year. And raising the maximum Pell Grant award, that's been part of the problem. The Pell Grants are not sufficient to keep up with the inflation. Uh, that maximum now goes to 6,895 uh, per year. 
And it's the largest increase in more than a decade, $400 more than the previous. Um, also delivers $895 million for the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant Program, um, an increase of $15 million. And then this one I really uh, think is important, $1.2 billion for federal work study. And um, I think when I talk to young people, that's what they're um, sort of oriented toward is, is working to help pay off your loans. So either working during school in a work study program or um, the types of programs where you are, are working in a field where you're doing some level of service to the community and you can get uh, a break on your loans that way. So I, th I think those programs are really important. Um, I can stop there, David, and see if there are others. I don't want to just ramble on, but if there are other things on people's minds that are more specific. And uh, I should have said this at the top, but Aaron Cotton uh, at the top here, uh, my wonderful housing staffer um, out of our Concord office. Aaron actually lives up in Plymouth, so she's very, very familiar with um, some of the rural housing issues herself. And um, uh, if you have, I know some of the questions that came through were very, very specific. I, I like to say beyond my pay grade. <laughs> it's not uh, something that, not a level of detail that I'm going to be familiar with. So Erin's um, going to put her information into the chat and, um, and you can reach out to her for more specificity. Great, Annie. Thank you so much for uh, all of that. Uh, there's so much going on and a lot of work going on behind the scenes. And um, you touched on the uh, affordable housing, spurring housing, and uh, student debt, uh, you know, several, uh, three of the many topics that we have out there. Um, as we move to open it up to uh, questions from the um, realtor audience out there, I just wanted to reiterate that we do have some things that we need a little more um, research on uh, before asking some of the pointed questions that we may not have solutions to right now. Um, and they're ongoing, working on the, the flood insurance is ongoing as well as um, certain loan uh, problems that we're seeing. And again, I urge the realtors to write these things down, the stories to me, send them to me, and I'll forward them to uh, Congresswoman Custer's office, and we'll get some more comprehensive uh, replies down the road, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so and the stories forward. are, sorry to interrupt, David, the stories are yeah. really helpful for me so that yeah. um, I know the particular problem we're trying to solve for, and then we can do the research to see, is there legislation that I could sign on to, or sometimes it's just a letter to the administration. Um, right. For example, that flood insurance, help me understand the issue there, if you could. Well, it's uh, rewriting uh, some of the um, regulations and also where we're funding uh, flood insurance for other regions that are flooded more. I'm not really quite sure any of uh, okay. that's where, where I need more research. Myself. Okay, yeah, no problem. Erin can help. I mean, and, and she can follow up with you after this as well. Okay. Uh, so moving forward then with the being sensitive to our time frame, uh, opening it up to uh, realtors out there, and I'll need some help from the staff to see who's raising hands and to call on folks. Um, sure, you can go that. into the chat or we can just go old school. If you raise your hand, I'll see you and uh, we'll let David know who's who's got a question. I overwhelm them with my facts and figures here. Um, uh. <laughs> I know that one of the questions that might take a little more digging um, was about the VA and Federal Housing Administration appraisal process. And that's the, uh, I don't know if that's somebody on this call that had the question, but we can, um, we can follow up. I th there was one I about- I think there was someone on this call. Mm -hmm. Was there anybody that wanted to ask about the appraisal process or explain to me what the problem is? Uh, go ahead, Kim. I think you you can just unmute. 
or maybe somebody behind the scenes has to let it. There we go. Thank yeah. you. Um, so this is third hand information. So I may not have it right. I heard from an appraiser that there were rule changes coming down the pipeline for VA and FHA loans that were going to require the appraisers to measure properties within a very tight margin. Um, in order as part of their appraisal process. And his comment was, that's gonna take me off the VA list. I'm not going to risk a testing to, you know, within an inch of a house size as part of my appraisal, because if something goes wrong, that makes me liable. And given that we're already, it's it, the, it appears to be we're already tight trying to get VA appraisers in, um, FHA appraisers in and the general knee-jerk reaction to sellers when they see a VA or FHA loan is not if I've got a better deal, not if I've got a conventional or a cash offer. That's making it already difficult for people who are in those loan processes um, to get on, even get looked at when they're buying a home. If there really is additional pressure coming in from the appraisal side, it's not gonna help the pipeline. Yep. Um, and, and again, I don't know the details of the, com yeah. the comment, but I thought it was really interesting that we're trying to expand availability and, and that seems like the opposite. Right, it sounds like overburdensome government regulation to me. So um, more than happy to look into it. Uh, just a side note, uh, my colleague, Chris Pappas is still on the VA committee. I was there for six years and then he took my seat. And so let's reach out Aaron to his team and see if they've heard about this, we can check in with VHA and, and um, I would absolutely join a letter of members saying, do not make it any more difficult uh, for veterans to get loans or for FHA. And particularly in the environment you're in with how quickly uh, homes are selling, anything that's gonna slow it up, my God, it's hard to get your toe in the door if you don't have a full-blown cash offer. So um, I, that's an excellent one. I'd be happy to follow up. I I have a follow-up to that within the VA component of things, which is also that if you look on the website, there appears to be some kind of um, rehab loan available under VA, but I've yet to find any banker that is actually providing that loan. And it's another containment. It's another restriction on veterans trying to find either an option on a property that maybe needs some work. Yeah. But yeah. doesn't call again doesn't qualify under the restrictive um, appraisal requirements for a VA loan. Yeah, I mean, you know, as the housing stock is tight, I think those kind of rehab renovation type loans are really important because what we ought to be doing is uh, motivating and incentivizing owners to take a risk on a property, put some blood, sweat and tears into it, fix it up, and then let them convert to a conventional loan for a much more valuable property. And certainly that makes a big difference in terms of the whole neighborhood lifting everybody's values just by a coat of paint and you know new roof and some curb appeal, you can really make a difference in a neighborhood with that. Um, so I, 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 I'm totally with you on this and I, I'd like to look into it, Aaron, a little bit more not just, I mean, for VA, yes, but let's look at other types of um, incentives for financial projects. I, my very first uh, home that I owned was a major <laughs> renovation. It was not even livable uh, when I took it on and I took the risk and uh, it, it was adorable when I left, I have to say. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Kim, for uh, bringing that up, and and Annie, thanks for addressing it as well. Yep, looks um, like Adam has a question, David. Okay. Yep, Adam, you're on mute. Great, Adam. Great, thanks, yeah, Congressman. Right, Adam. Um, just, I just want to share a very brief story about how that particular, the appraisals do hurt the veterans in the end. I know an agent; they got about 14 offers on a house in Fremont. One of the offers was 130 thousand over asking because it was a veteran. And they were trying to anticipate that the seller would not want to go through that process, which they were right. That seller went with a cash offer, significantly less money, but could close quicker. 
So, so okay. it really can negatively impact it, like whether they get the house or not, but even if in that case they got the house, they would have overly been paying in the sense that they were just desperate to get in. Wow. Yeah, and these are, I mean- it, That's it, heartbreaking. They think they have to pay 130 grand more and they still didn't get it. No. And wow. we personally, in my office, I'm a broker. Uh, we had a veteran. They were so discouraged with this process that they had to sell. They rented a room. My One of my agents let them rent a room free of charge, but did a little lease for them so that they didn't have to sell something so that when they put in an offer, it wasn't contingent on the sale. And oh. now he's now he has a house, but it took quite a while for that to happen. So, oh my gosh. so we are getting creative as much as we can to help veterans, but we would appreciate any further help that we can get for sure. Yeah, that sounds like a really good issue for us to work on uh, with Chris Pappas. And, and thank you. These stories are really helpful. And I am Congressman Pappas's federal political coordinator. I'm I'm his David, let's say. Oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. So I will I will talk. Oh, let's follow up together then. That's Absolutely. great. Because I'm I'm sure he's got to be hearing this. You know, uh, towns like uh, Summersworth and Dover and Rochester, there's a lot of old housing stock that, uh, you know, a veteran could go in and fix things. I mean, veterans have talents, you know, <laughs> and we know they work hard. They put their shoulder to the wheel. They'd, they'd clean up some of this older housing and really make a difference. That's great. I'd love to work on that. Anybody Adam, else? Adam, thanks. Yeah. Um... We'll take maybe one more and then I'll turn over to Annie Lentz, but uh, other questions from, from the realtor audience? Yep, it looks like Bill Taylor. Hey, great, go ahead, Bill. Uh, this is, I guess, more of a story for you to hear. In this area, the Peterborough, um, Peterborough Jaffrey area, I mean, we have a bunch of smaller little towns around us that don't have a ton of business going on. They don't have a ton of anything going on, but Peterborough has, we have a regional hospital, Monadnock Community Hospital. We have New Hampshire Ball Bearings. Uh, we have the in Jaffrey in Peterborough. There, there's a ton of high-end medical product facilities, and every single one of them could probably hire 200 people apiece. But yeah, there's... I know one that's looking for 800 people. Yeah, well, Mil yeah, Millipore and Tel Teleflex yes. together are yes. looking for over a thousand. Um, and it doesn't matter what they pay, there's no place for people to move. Yeah, there's yeah. no place for them to live. And that is not new to the pandemic that was prior even to the pandemic. Yeah. Now it's just even worse. But I mean, you can't make 15 or $18 an hour and afford anything. Right. And you know, I, a lot of it for this area comes right back, for, I'm sure everybody that's listening, it comes back to school funding. Yeah. Three, over two thirds of everybody's tax bills are going directly to the schools. And so for our local governments, and I'm as you heard that, I'm a selectman in Peterborough, for our local governments to try and come up with an affordable housing option or expand housing is just impossible. Yeah. Because the, there's no money left to drag out of people. We have critical infrastructure needs in all of our towns. And the, the coming up with funding, state and federal, is the absolute key to expanding anything. We yeah. just can't. I mean, we, we're already stretched to the limit with the school funding. And it's, and it's only getting worse because, as everybody knows, particularly this year, when in Peterborough, we budgeted 30% for a 30% increase in, in heating fuels, pellets, we do a lot of alternative energy in Peterborough and electricity costs. Each one of our departments had to budget for a 30% increase in that. Our, our overall town budget came in flat, but for the school system to have increases like that when they're already at a $53 million budget shared by nine very little towns, it's it's just completely restrictive. And not only does that push up the cost of rent for anybody, for a landlord that actually has some housing stock to offer, it, it drives out the people that are making 15 to $18 an hour. And then all these companies that are looking for, I mean, they, they, we could probably support 2000 new jobs within an eight mile area from where I'm sitting right now. And there is no place for them for those people to go. 
Yeah. So it's, I mean, I don't even know what the answer is. When I visited Millipore and, and, you know, you wind around and you, you're in a total residential neighborhood getting there. And then they told me they wanted to hire 800 people. I'm like, from where, what, what was your plan, you know, in terms of where they would live? where they would come from, what the transportation would be like, and that many people on the roads. And But it's a great company and it's growing and they love being here. People here are really motivated workers. They do a great job. You know, that type of precision uh, manufacturing, they're really impressed with it. But yeah, and all of these things are very tied together, but I agree with you, it's housing first. You know, if you don't have the housing, you are not going to be able to draw people uh, to those positions. So um, maybe we need to get that fellow back that is working on that great renovation up in uh, Claremont and find a mill right near you that, uh, you know, that we could, because I think I've, I've seen this around the state. These younger people are perfectly happy to live that apartment style living in a, in a mill building. You know, if it's if it's beautiful, if it's well done, um, they don't necessarily. At least my kids and their friends, they don't want to mow lawns the way we did. They don't want to shovel the walk the way we did. They've got a life. Um, I went, by the way, to your new brewery in Peterborough that was very nice. And, and, you know, you have quality of life there, restaurants and arts and a wonderful community. So I'm happy to brainstorm with you and, and work, work on that um, because they, these other parts of the district that I'm talking about have really had successful projects. And it would be great to do one, you know, down near you that, um, that did really make a dent in the housing stock. And when, when you do one of these big projects, that one in uh, Claremont that I was talking about, I think he said it was 84 units in one building. That blew my mind. I mean, 84 units is really going to change uh, downtown Claremont. Yeah, and it wasn't the only one. There's another one that's also gone up. So um, let, let's get together and see if we can't, you know, come up with some funding um, and, and one of the programs that I should mention is called the um, uh, Northern Borders Regional Commission. Um, th this won't help Peterborough, but right next door, uh, it covers Cheshire County. And I've just filed legislation to include Merrimack County. Um, this is Carroll, Coas, um, Sullivan, Grafton, Sullivan, and Belknap. And it's, we've really increased the amount every year. And this is millions of dollars in funding for grants um, that go right out the door. Uh, so that's something too, we can think about it's, it's seed money, you know, to plan a project or to get housing going, it, it, it can really make a difference. And then, as I mentioned that USDA uh, rural development can look for opportunities with that as well. So lots of possibilities, David, but yeah, we've yep. got to get yep. Pedro back on the top of the list in terms of uh, affordable housing, because there are a lot of jobs over there. These are great companies. They're very impressive. I have a, a side note to add, and I'll be one of the question askers here. Um, not really a question, but an observation is, as a result of COVID, we're seeing, um, well, this is on a decline before COVID, but shopping malls and empty uh, malls such as well, smaller and larger malls and uh, corporations that are closing or shutting their doors or moving, uh, those buildings are sitting empty and there are some possibilities to repurpose them into some type of housing. Uh, the Peerless building in Keene, a large insurance building out in West Keene, sat empty for quite some time and the hospital did come along and, and take it as additional space, which was great. But had it been there a while longer, that would have uh, possibly been be able to be turned into some uh, decent housing uh, has the plumbing infrastructure the the structure itself the location um, so i think looking at the empty commercial spaces coming up and shopping malls those are our modern day equivalent of the old mills that are being repurposed yeah um, yep i so think that's a great idea in. i think that's a great idea and you know um there are changes that are going to come out of covid i mean um the type of uh, commercial real estate office buildings are going to change quite a bit. People, 
Um, I've talked to so many employers in New Hampshire and, and all across the country that um, their employees do not want to come back to an office. They, I went and visited uh, Fidelity down in Merrimack. This was a couple of months ago, but it, out of they have a campus for 5,000. It's the old digital campus, two huge buildings, um, you know, gymnasium and a pond and like they make it beautiful and the food and the restaurant, the cafeteria and all this. They had 400 people there that day. And what they have found, all these companies, the productivity was incredibly high on remote working. So they don't, and because of this tight job market, those two things combined, they're not really in a position to force people back and then add the high cost of gasoline with the war in Ukraine. People don't want to spend two hours in the car uh, going back and forth. They want to be home and walk their dog and meet the kids when they come home from school and, um, you know, go do a doctor's appointment in the middle of the day or whatever. Um, and they have maintained their productivity at work. I think that's a really important point. So there are going to be changes. And then the other thing that I thought you were going to mention is the number of people who moved to New Hampshire um, during COVID because they could telework, they could do remote work. And this has been all across the state, particularly um, again, near the ski communities. We've seen a lot of that, um, but on the lakes, um, I'm sure in the Monadnock region, it's so beautiful. People came to second homes. Uh, they came and bought second homes and then sold their homes in the city. Um, and, you know, they all need broadband. Uh, they all need services. In some of the communities, it's been hard because they're not paying more taxes. Back to Bill's point about taxes, they were already paying the taxes if they had a, a ski chalet or a condo, but now they're using more services. Their kids are in the school, they're living there year round. Um, so it is putting a little pressure on in terms of property taxes in some communities for sure. Uh, so there will continue to be changes and you know the realtors are gonna be right on the front lines of that. Uh, you always are so helpful for me with the trends. Uh, David's great at getting me the statistics and I can follow. Um, but wow, the environment that you've been in, I have quite a few realtor friends and they tell me about uh, just the pressure cooker that you've been under when a, when a house does come on the market. You know, as you say, 21 offers right on top of each other. That's, that's a very intense place. And when you're trying to help you know, your, your clients, people, young people getting into a house or a family that you've worked with before, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be heartbreaking uh, to help them compete in that market. So, Great. well, uh, I'm going to have to wrap up here shortly, David, anything else before we go? I think, thanks everybody for the questions. I think before we go, I'll turn it to Annie uh, Lentz, I think, uh, was going to take it from here for a moment and then toss it right back to me at the end. Sure. Yes. Correct? Yes, okay. I will. And I just want to make sure we have a little bit of time for press questions at the end. Um, I know that we have Michael from Union Leader. If you want to ask a question or unmute, you're free to do so now. Or if anybody else has any last minute questions um, before we close out. Hey, Michael, thanks for being with us. If you have a question, we're happy to take it now. Hi, hi there, Congresswoman. This is Mike. Um, are there any specific proposals that realtors would like to see in terms of creating more workforce housing? Is it just a matter of more density being allowed or more economic incentives uh, that will also have to be offered? Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Bill Taylor. Uh, the, the answer to that question isn't a simple one. One of the issues or the biggest, probably the biggest issue that we face with anything that's related to affordable housing is that say for instance, in Peterborough, there's, there was just a recent subdivision that, you know, they were or a couple, they were hoping to shoot in the affordable range, what, whatever that means at this point, affordable. <laughs> I don't even know what the definition of that is now, but 
you know, when they start out, a, a builder or a developer can can have the goal of uh, of building affordable housing, but if there's somebody willing to pay four hundred thousand dollars for a two hundred thousand dollar house, we have no tools at our disposal to make him sell it for two hundred thousand dollars, and there's no incentive for anybody to develop property and sell it for half of what they could get or you know anywhere less than what they could get on the market so the real ch the real challenge is having some sort of structure or funding so that a developer or a builder can have can be incentivized to build something that the average person can can live in that can go work in the hospital and be a nurse or any any level position anywhere but the one of the challenges, which is also a great benefit of this area, is that it's a very, very sought after area, the entire Manadnock region. Unfortunately, that brings with it people that have $500,000 to throw down in cash and raises up prices. And the average person that had 200 to spend or 300 to spend two or three years ago is now completely out of the market. And there's absolutely no incentive for a builder or a seller to sell for any less than top market value. So there's where our challenge is. Yeah, I, I think Mike, um, just to put in a plug for some of these programs that do have restrictions, the one that I'm focused on is this low income housing tax credit um, that's a subsidy for acquisition, construction and rehabilitation of affordable rental housing for low and moderate income tenants. So that's a little bit different than what, um, what Bill was just describing is, yeah, if you build a house that you think is gonna be in the 200 range that a family, a working family might be able to afford and then somebody comes in and offers 400, we don't, we don't have anything to, um, you know, to, to that's capitalism. Like we, we don't have anything to stop that from happening. And I think that's part of this pressure from outside. The people who moved here during COVID uh, in most of these communities and whether it's Monadnock region, Lakes region, Mount Washington Valley, uh, Upper Valley. Um, I mean, the Upper Valley nurses have to drive an hour to get to Dartmouth-Hitchcock because there is nothing, you know, similar kind of problem. Um, and that's why we've got to rethink some of these programs for a different type of housing. And, and, and you mentioned density, Mike. I, th I think it is probably a density issue where, you know, not single family own your home with a couple of acres, mm -hmm. but um, multi, uh, multi unit housing is, is more what we've got to focus on to, uh, to make it more affordable. Um, but as I said, for a lot of the young people, that, that's what they're fine with. That's what they would be living with if they were in the city. Um, you know, it's amazing what they jam themselves into. My, my son in Brooklyn, 900 feet is palatial. <laughs> so, you know, what they're, what they're used to is very different. Um, but we'll keep working, you know, on those affordability issues and look for incentives so that builders, you know, we're not going to get builders to do this work for free or at a discount without the incentive. And the other thing, Bill, that I thought you were going to mention, right now you start out building a $200,000 home, but with the price of wood and materials, you get to the end of it and, and it turns out to be a $300,000 home by the time you put it on the market. And then somebody comes in and offers 400, you know. It, it's sort of we're all we're all chasing this right now for a bit. It's it's the same for multifamily that I mean, if somebody can take a three acre lot that you could put 40 units, it's not even necessarily density because, uh, you know, most of the towns around here will will you, know, you can run through a zoning board and just about everybody knows that it's absolutely imperative that we have more apartment type structures. But the incentive for to take a three or five or 10 acre lot and put two or three 10 or 15 unit buildings on it is zero when you can sell a 1600, 1600 square foot house for 500,000 bucks. Why would you build apartments there? So that's yeah. that's the primary crux of incentivizing builders to build something like this. 
Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. Um, can I ask you all a quick question? If you know the answer, what happened to the state legislation that was going to allow homeowners to have another unit on their property, like, you know, in-law apartment, that kind of thing? Is, is that happening more? Have you seen more of that? It's already allowed. Okay. Accessory and dwelling units you're talking about, yes. ADQs. Yeah. A lot of towns are are mixing it up with the with the smallest size or the largest size that's allowed, but access, accessory dwelling units are allowed. And there is generally legislation that's that's moving the needle around on that in either direction, but it is it is available. H have and you super helpful. Yeah, I have that's what I'm wondering if you've seen much interest in it. Um, you know, people adding a unit on or a, over a garage or in the barn or something like that, because that's that would, that would be a way to increase, um, you know, housing stock, increase access. I think it's been slow to catch on, but it is out there. I think it's an awareness has to uh, be out there a little bit more, but it, it has started some, but I haven't seen it explode. Uh, but it, yes, as Bill said, it is out there. It, it is happening. I think the legislation said stated that it was um, an attached. The the state said you couldn't that the towns couldn't say no to an attached accessory dwelling, but they still have the ability to say no to a detached accessory dwelling, and that's yeah. been a town to town thing. Yeah. So you'd have to focus on like uh, an apartment over the garage that's attached by a breezeway or something like that Even beyond a breezeway some of the definitions were were kind of specific um oh and, interesting yeah that may not they may have to develop over time right um, and not everybody wants to live with their in-laws but <laughs> well um david thank you again oh whoops it looks like yeah, uh, robin have you got something on your mind yeah, um, the other thing is uh, the attached or detached. I mean, that's every town has their different regulations, basically. But what I'm seeing, and that is there's a lot of people that own two, three, four different houses. So that could be a problem in, in why there's a, a housing shortage. I mean, you can go through New Hampshire and, you know, you have driveways that are not plowed. And, and it's like, because you know that they have, this is a second or a third or a fourth yeah. home. Yeah. So it's like, you know, and I, I'm not, I don't want to say you can only own so many different homes. This is, this is a free country, but it, it that is one of the things it's, it's just, <laughs> Well, and one of the things that I am so aware of as we're, you know, emerging from COVID, from this terrible pandemic for two years, you know, it, the impact was variable. People at the top tended to do extremely well in their investments, um, you know, many, many people, the people who could afford to work from home, the white collar jobs, they never missed a paycheck. And, and um, they, as I say, people were moving from Boston, buying another house up here, and maybe they already have a house on the Cape and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and if you go to the ski communities, you see a lot of that. I mean, very, very high end, you know, I'm not talking like 500,000. I'm talking about million dollar properties where they they call them, uh, they used to call them anyway, 333. Three, three. Uh, they sold for $3 million. There's three people in the family and they come for three weeks a year. Now in the Western ski areas, they call them 10, 10, 10, 10 million dollars. They have one party for 10 people over the holidays and they come from 10 days a year. <laughs> And you go to those resorts and they're just empty, miles and miles and miles of empty houses like you're talking about. So I, I don't think that is to that degree happening here quite yet, but it's a really, that will skew your local community for sure. Um, and you know where are the people gonna come from that are doing the jobs that keep the community going? And, and whether it's teachers or nurses or police or 
um, you know, we've got to make sure that they can still afford to live in the communities. So, well, that's a good note to end on, David. Thank you. All right. For, well, I wanna... uh, and we'll see you in person next. Are you coming? Yes, to we will. Uh, I'll are be you... in DC in May at the mid year. I hope to see you if you're there then. We'll, we'll get in touch. And uh, I want to thank what? everyone for the patience with my little glitch here. <laughs> and okay. we will do the late summer or fall, but let's next one for sure definitely be in person. We'll, we'll have a lot more to talk about. And we have a lot of work to do. So Super. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, thanks everyone for their participation. And um, follow up with me with stories and questions that we can continue to send to uh, uh, Congresswoman Custer's office. And look forward to doing this again. Terrific. Thank you so uh, much. Take care, uh, everybody. Stay perfect. safe out there. Thank you.